There are now only 11 working days until the new mandatory data breach notification becomes law. And to adapt a famous idiom about preparation, give me 11 days to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first eight of them sharpening my axe. I'm going to talk about what we need to be doing to ensure that our communications blade is sharp, and to ensure that when mandatory notifications come to us, we are well prepared for chopping down that particular tree. This um, really tortuous metaphor will continue, by the way. <laughs> so look, we've all been to dozens of cyber events, haven't we, over the last 12 months or so? And yet most of us are probably here at the start of February because we know this law is coming. We know things are changing. But I suspect a lot of people haven't done what they needed to do yet. So uh, let's talk about the preparation that everybody in this room needs to be involved with between now and the 22nd of February some of the practical steps that you need to consider for your communications. I think it's probably worth noting something that Tom said earlier on as well about the fact that compliance is not enough. If you think that just complying to these new rules is sufficient, you haven't understood the potential impact on your brand, on the trust that your client's holding you, your share price, your staff well-being even, following a, a really debilitating cyber attack or data breach and, and the, the fallout of uh, bad communications when that happens. So from a best practice perspective, there are things which you can do now to make your communications response uh, to a data breach more efficient and more effective, and it will save you money in the long term. Years of broader cyber hacks and breaches in other territories have shown that businesses which actively think about this before it happens to them respond better, respond quicker, and save an awful lot of money. Some of the insurers, and my friends at Marshall will tell you this, some of the insurers are now even valuing evidence of a communications plan, if you are hit with a, uh, some sort of data breach that's notifiable, as a gateway to cheaper premiums. So, you know, to return to my metaphor, getting your axes sharpened now means your policy providers might sharpen their pencils. So, here is an exciting looking document. This is the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner's Guide to Developing a Data Breach Response Plan. Uh, you may have seen this. This is available online, of course. And in it, under the paragraph, what should the data breach response plan cover, it says your data plan should include a clear and immediate communication strategy that allows for the prompt notification of affected individuals and other relevant entities. This is a key sentence from my perspective as a communicator, because a communications plan in the context of a data breach, a notifiable data breach, cannot be a copy and paste of your crisis response plan. And here's why. In a traditional crisis, there's usually a discrete or finite number of communication engagements you'd need to make. If we take the example of a a tragic work workplace death, you're going to have to communicate with the family, you're going to have to communicate with the workers, there may be some uh, government bodies you need to dis discuss that with, or regulators, there will certainly be some media interest, but the bulk of that, the intensity of that, will be over the first 24 to 48 hours probably. And then there'll be a lower level of communication engagement after that over the length of the investigation. And most communications teams can manage that sort of issue over the first few days. It's intense and it's pretty stressful, but it's doable. But in the case of a data breach, especially if you've got an awful lot of data that's been stolen or, or breached, suddenly you've got hundreds, maybe thousands, of possible individuals affected. And that requirement for mass communications with those number of people is a real game changer. Because every single one of them is highly motivated by what's happened. It's not just an article in the newspaper that is of interest. It's their data. They're personally involved. They will want to know what's happening, and they will have questions, and they won't have any qualms about asking questions about what's happened on social media channels, whether you're on those social channels or not. Hundreds might be trying to phone your reception with questions. Dealing with a sudden influx of angry, um, scared, possibly confused people needs serious communications planning. And having the resources to deal with the communications that surround what will happen after you have to notify about a data breach is, is considerable. 
So look, most of us in this room don't work for consumer-facing or retail brands. And that probably means we're not naturally set up for that form of mass communication. So I'm going to go back to my axe metaphor again, I'm afraid. To sharpen your communication skills, well, that's where the whetstone of the communication plan comes into play. So what does that look like? Well, Domino's is an example of when communication doesn't work too well. In October, it was discovered that they had been breached and that data including email addresses, locations, names of customers, names of partners who are also the ones that maybe pick up the pizzas had been stolen. And that resulted in thousands of phishing emails going to Domino's customers full of information that a stranger should not know about you and inviting those people to click on really dodgy links. And there's evidence online of people talking about this. It's caused serious distress to them being the focus of that kind of activity. Now, the company initially chose not to inform their customers about the data breach, even though they knew it had happened. And instead, it took people on the internet and social media talking about it for this to really come to light. And the media got hold of it. And of course, at that point, Domino's did decide to respond. A very legally response. Legally, is that a, it's an OK term, isn't it? Yeah. A legally response where it pointed out that it was aware of the issue, it was investigating it, but it had no legal requirement to inform customers at the time. That's true. In October, that was probably the case, but it won't be the case in two weeks' time. And I noticed that although they did eventually put a statement up on their corporate website explaining what was going on, they didn't publish anything on their social media accounts. And Domino's is a business that's had quite an innovative few years in terms of digital technologies. A lot of their business has been built on digital technologies. And I think arguably their customers are more likely to see this kind of messaging when it's on their Facebook page than having to go to a media release page on the corporate website. So the negative impact of all this did affect their share price in Australia. But perhaps worse than that, it also undermined the trust that the company had built up using social and digital channels with their customers in the previous years. And their brand has taken a sizable knock in Australia. If you go online even now, you'll see people using Domino's as a byword for slack or dodgy online security. And just as an aside on this case study, it wasn't actually Domino's directly who were breached. It was actually a third party supplier. But Domino's, when this law comes into effect, it, will be, it would have been up to them to um, bear the brunt of the communications and the response because people had put their information into the systems through the Domino's brand. But it's an interesting one from a, when you're, you're writing your data breach um, guidelines is what third parties may have access to some of your data and have you considered whether their secure, security is good as well. So that's Domino's. It wasn't a great outcome for them. But let's contrast that with the Red Cross, who were the unfortunate focus of one of Australia's largest ever data breaches a couple of years ago, when the personal medical information of about half a million people was accidentally uploaded to their website. So this wasn't even a hack. This was just somebody pressing the wrong button, which meant a file sat on their website for 12 months. It wasn't particularly obvious, but somebody ultimately discovered it and downloaded it. However, how they responded from a communications perspective is absolutely textbook stuff. And I encourage you to do a bit of research to look at what they did. First of all, they fessed up and acknowledged that this had happened. And that buys you goodwill with people who, as I mentioned before, are likely to be highly motivated and interested in what's going on with their personal data. There were media releases. There were media contact sheets. They had a distribution timetable for that. They will have had additional staffing to take calls. They apologized and kept stakeholders informed throughout the process. They set up an entirely special section on their website with more information for people who were motivated to find out additional uh, details about what had happened. And they kept people updated as the process continued. In short, I think they showed real leadership following an unfortunate incident. And, and you know, best practice by owning the problem and addressing the resolution. And the ability to own this sort of issue when we're in a world where we may have to tell the government and our clients and customers that it's happened, I think is really important. Getting out in front of it, even publicizing it, is a much better strategy than pretending it didn't happen. People get angrier when they're not told about a data breach than when they are told about a data breach especially if part of your response is to explain what you're doing so it won't happen again. And Uber's a really good example of that in, in recent months. So when you unpick the communications 
preparation that the Australian Red Cross did to manage their issue, it's pretty considerable, actually. And I would ask you whether your own businesses would respond in quite such an effective way if this happened to you this afternoon. Could you get a cyber response page on your website live in the next two hours? Could you get your CEO to record a video and use that as the face of the response and put that uh, out through your media channels on your social media platforms to show that you know what's going on and that you're across it? Do you have the passwords for your social media accounts or your websites, for example? Are the resources in place if you need to step up a gear after the first 24 or 48 hours uh, with regards to a, a reportable data breach? For most of us, I suspect the answer to at least some of those questions is no. So as we prepare for this introduction of this new law, by all means, get your insurance in place. It's vital. By all means, make sure that your IT security is up to scratch. By all means, speak to the legal experts about what you may have to do. But don't forget about the communications response. It is absolutely vital. And I'll leave you with a few questions to answer to ensure your communications axe is sharpened. Have you got a communications plan as part of your mandatory data breach notification strategy? The OAIC says you should. Do you know who your stakeholders are and how you would contact them? It's particularly important if you've got more than a few hundred. How do you do mass communications for thousands of people whose data you may own? And have you templated what you would say in the first hour, the first day, and the first week? You may not know exactly what the issue is, but you know the kinds of things you're going to have to say and to whom. So do you have that stuff written down now to get you through that first period of a major uh, cyber or data breach? Thank you.